cancellation, the cancellation last year was obviously um, a bit of a bummer, but um, I'm really happy that I have the opportunity to talk about uh, our project today. And um, I was going to start uh, right by thanking the Matariki Network and of course uh, John University, but also Horizon 2020 for the funding. So this is a huge project uh, with a number of uh, partners and I thought I'm going to start with showing you some of the partners up here. This is actually a picture from our kickoff meeting in Brussels a few years ago when we were just awarded the, the, the money and we were uh, starting um, with the organization. Now, the project um, is uh, a collaboration between a number of universities. So we, we have Durham University, Stuttgart, Gdansk, Clermont Auberge, Lund, Bergen, Bielefeld, Pasteur, and the MPE in, in Göttingen for biophysical chemistry, but also a, um, a number of um, small um, and medium sized entities, uh, companies in the, biotech, uh, in, in the biotech area. And I think that's quite important because. Uh, um, the project was called Viral Metagenomics for Innovation Value. So per se, it is not a biomedical project, but it's really a project that was looking towards uh, new products for innovation, uh, something that really comes into, into the pipeline. And hopefully I'm going to show you how this actually worked out from the very beginning, from the genome up to products uh, at the moment on, on, on the market. And these companies really steered a lot of our uh, direction. Again, it's quite a big project uh, and I, I can't really name everybody, but what we did is uh, we uh, just submitted a paper to FEMS Microbiology Letters, which should come out in a couple of months, where we put everybody involved in the project uh, as a co-author. So even the summer students in Iceland who worked on the project for the, uh, just a couple of months were added onto, this, onto the paper so that really everybody has, uh, has, has a stake in this and, and their contribution was, was acknowledged. The one name that I want to really highlight is uh, my, my friend and collaborator, Arthur Averson. He is really the person who initiated the project and he also happens to be first in the author bit, so he's the first author on this paper. So Arthur is the one person you're probably going to hear uh, a, a few more times about this. Now, having given you the back background, I just wanted to start very quickly uh, with an um, introduction into, into viruses actually. Um, about two years ago, I probably wouldn't have to, uh, would have to do this a bit more in a bit more detail, but by now everybody has thought about viruses. Coronavirus has really changed what we know about viruses. Um, so these are subcellular organisms. They have a parasitic life cycle, um, and they require the cellular machinery of their host to replicate. Viruses um, have a genome that is either DNA or RNA, and they are normally surrounded by a protein shell, sometimes with a membrane around it. So they're really tiny, small, small particles that uh, affect the cell. And they need the cell to replicate. Why are we so interested in viruses? We're interested in viruses because they are so incredibly successful. Uh, they do infect all other forms of life, from humans up to bacteria. Um, and many people believe they're also a major drive of, of evolutions. Now, they also have a very high mutation rate. Again, something we uh, hear and about pretty much every day at the, these days. And this high mutation rate leads to an incredible diversity of, on the genome level. So it's estimated that uh, on the planet there tend to be the power of 31, so astronomical numbers of viruses uh, everywhere. And the vast majority, majority of these viruses are of course not, not even um, um, being identified. So in a sense, viruses uh, represent a huge dark matter of genomic information and we were setting out and uh, trying to find um, some of this diversity and use some of this diversity in viruses for um, our biotechnology applications. Now, in a very simple picture, a virus uh, that infects a bacteria is called a bacteriophage. And we can sort of look at the life cycle in a few simple steps. So I should emphasize this is a rather simplified uh, life cycle that I've used from here. So the DNA uh, in this case, simplified with a sort of a, a piece of a double helix uh, uh, DNA is in a capsid, needs to have entry into um, the cell. In the cell, the DNA is then translated into messenger RNA. So messenger RNA is usually linear with loops. And this is then translated by the uh, machinery of the host into proteins. And our proteins become interesting for us because proteins are linear polypeptides and as shown here, they have a defined three-dimensional shape. And it's this 
unique three-dimensional shape that each enriched protein has as that determines its function. And I'm a structural biologist, so we are really interested in determining the three-dimensional shapes of these proteins that are often just shown as helices and strands in order to find out more about their function. Now, these proteins then replicate the genetic material of the virus again, make more proteins by mRNA, for example, the capsid proteins. And then this is being assembled with the new genetic material, the capsid, into a new virus, which then is assembled and escapes in, uh, into the environment. So the steps that we are particularly interested in, sort of these steps here, these proteins uh, that um, process DNA and the proteins that help the assembly and the escape of the virus. These are the two types of proteins and machineries that we're interested in because they are important tools in biotechnology. Um, the list of proteins that are now used in uh, biotechnology is far too, too, too big to, to mention them all. And over the last couple of months, we all have become familiar with uh, some of the key tools because of um, uh, um, COVID-19. So everybody has heard about PCR reaction at these times. So this is the uh, gold standard of COVID-19 detection where the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2, which in this case is RNA, is being converted into DNA. And this step is done by certain viral trans reverse transcript phases. So this step would not work without the tools that we have developed in biotechnology in the past decades in order to convert our RNA back into DNA. Um, in the step, DNA is then um, amplified with a protein from a bacteria. This is Thomas aquatius or um, TAC DNA polymerase. This is the step that is then used for the detection. Now, the reason these two enzymes are used so widely now in the polymerase chain reaction is A, they've been around for a, a number of years, they're well studies, but also both of these enzymes that are now being used are no longer under patent protection. So um, the uh, PCR reaction that is being used all over the world uh, for um, COVID-19 detection can be replicated by an, any lab without any patents uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the second step that's really important that, uh, in um, uh, COVID-19 response is next generation sequencing or NGS sequencing, where scientists look at the different um, um, strains of COVID-19 to see where the mutations occur and which strains become more and more um, um, virulent. And again, the whole sample generation of uh, sample preparation of next generation sequencing relies on a number of enzymes that have viral, uh, viral origin. So examples are T4 DNA polymerase or T4 polynucleotide kinase. So again, this next generation sequencing that is absolutely vital for our response to COVID-19 would really not work without our viral enzymes. Now, what is important in terms of uh, our goal is that each of these uh, applications requires tailor-made enzymes. So these need to work at a certain pH. In another application, they need to work at high temperature soil concentration and so on. So whereas we have a number of tools available, there's a need to have more and more specialized tools that uh, can be used for more and more specialized applications. So the question that we are really set, we're setting out with, with the virus X proposal is, um, where do we find these fantastic enzymes that can do all of these amazing things, in particular with DNA? And, and here Arndt comes into place because um, he had uh, the initial answer uh, for, for these questions because he lives in a little village called Clara Gerdi, which is right where the two tectonic plates in Iceland meet. Um, and as a consequence, uh, just a couple of miles from his place, there are a number of um, hot lakes and hot springs where almost boiling water comes out of, of the earth. Um, so our first starting point is that we were using these habitats to search for new material. And in fact, this is a picture we took a couple of years ago where the entire Virus X team actually went up to, to Iceland and uh, we visited places where, in particular, Mattis, the, the lead company from, from Iceland, were doing their, their um, uh, bioprospecting. So we actually took a couple of gallons of water on, from these uh, lakes and brought them down uh, in, into, into the lab. Um, the second place that we were looking at was actually led by the University of Bergen, and it's called Loki's Castle. Now, being an avid Avenger fan, I obviously know that about Loki's Castle, uh, which is a field of black smokers in the Atlantic Ocean discovered in 2008. 
and is named after the Norse god of trickery, Loki, because of its unworldly uh, um, uh, um, and habitat. Now, um, Hollywood obviously used a uh, posh British act, um, actor to um, simplify or to symbolize um, uh, the villain. Nevertheless, um, the University of Bergen has been working on uh, bioprospecting for quite some, some, some years, and they've developed these remote operated vehicles uh, that collect samples from 2,350 meters down the ocean, where the temperatures can be up to 300 degrees Celsius and the pressure is more than 230 atmospheres. So these are really extreme environments. And I think when it, these were first developed, people were surprised um, how teeming life is down there. And I've got a video of this that I've taken uh, from the remote operating vehicle. So these are black smokers, they're about eight to 50 meters high, and the temperatures can be up to 300 degrees in the center. And then of course the temperature gradient goes to about minus 0.7 degrees uh, uh, normal water temperature. So within this uh, um, um, Loki's castle, um, deep smokers, there's a whole array of, of different uh, uh, life forms. So basically they then took samples up uh, to the surface for further analysis. Um, now the sample preparation itself is far from tricky because out of these liters and liters of sample, uh, we wanted to um, find the genetic material. And there's quite a lot of optimization steps involved, filtration steps and so on to enrich the viral material from, from those samples. Um, now, the samples are then being sequenced uh, by next generation uh, technologies, particular involved well, was the University of Bielefeld in this. I'm showing here Olaf who are taking samples and Svenja sending in front of one of those nano sequencing machines um, that uh, produces uh, really terabytes of da data. And one thing that I think is uh, really remarkable in terms of technology that this little machine here on the bench top up here is one of those nanopore sequencing machines. And with just a few microliters of sample coming out of several liters of sample up here, um, um, thousands of genes are being sequenced almost automatically. So the next generation sequencing uh, revolution enables us to produce this vast amount of data, uh, which then is simply uh, stored in forms of the uh, base pairs, A, C, G, C, N, and so on and so on. So this is the area where then it becomes a bit more interesting for me because the challenge of course is how do we get in information or the relevant information out of these terabytes of data. So together with uh, Bielefeld and in particular the Biophysical uh, Chemistry uh, Institute, so we developed a, a, a pipeline where basically the metagenomic sequences up here which is all the genomic data from an entire habitat goes to an entire pipeline of sorting, binning, classifications in order to find the genes that are of, uh, of, of interest. And in the end, they developed also a data browser, which then the end user, particularly we, could use to find again the targets that we are interested in. And remember, we are this, uh, talking about millions and millions of sequences. Of course, we can only look at maybe a few hundred of those sequences um, in, in, in detail. So there's quite a lot of methods development and development of algorithms involved in this little in this little overview. So, what did we find? Well, one thing we found, and this is in particular the work from the Institute Pasteur in, in Paris, uh, they found several new viruses uh, and characterized those viruses. And I'm just showing one of those pictures that they uh, they have done by electron microscopy. So these are very unusual uh, shapes of viruses. And they also have very unusual chemistry and biochemistry. Um, overall, within this project, we had millions and millions of sequences. And this was in, stored in our proprietary data, data, database, EMGP2. And at the moment, we have about 50 million genes, new genes in this database. Now, if you think about this, there's 50 million genes waiting for further analysis. So in a sense, I think this is going to keep me busy for, um, for the rest of my life. Because out of these 50 million genes, we were only able to look at 659 proteins that were selected as targets for our detailed studies. So we really have to come down from millions of millions of genes to a relatively small number of proteins that we can look into in, in detail. Um, so one of the partners that was very involved in this is Biopedic, another company that, uh, uh, that was involved in um, software development. point on John took the lead because we were the lead of the protein characterization uh, pipeline. So 
the target selection, as I've mentioned before, um, aided and by our biotech account, uh, partners in, in Flint and uh, in, um, in Norway, basically put our targets into three different categories. So A were proteins with a known activity or desired product property. So these are particular those end lysines that help the escape of the virus because they lyse cells and all of those DNA processing enzymes. So from the sequences of our, um, of our genes, we have an idea that these proteins are likely to be an lysine, but there might be something novel, uh, they might be particular thermostable and so on. And then we have gene products that were sort of on the, on, on, on the, on, on the verge, where there might be an idea what they do, but it's not quite clear. So these were selected because we really wanted to give those genes to our software developers so that they can actually fine tune their uh, algorithms for gene annotation. And then the last group, maybe the group that I was most interested in were those model proteins that have absolutely new functions or absolutely new molecular mechanisms. And I, I should say that we dreamt about uh, developing the next CRISPR gene editing technology, um, but that didn't quite happen. I should say anybody who's an expert in this field, we did actually find a number of CRISPR associated proteins from thermophilic uh, um, um, organisms that are actually coming into biotechnology as well. So um, how do we go from genes to function? Well, all of the proteins were produced in E. coli. These are sort of standard uh, protein production facilities. And, and we really pooled expertise and skills from all different sides. So for example, we took uh, plasmids and expression systems developed at the University of Stuttgart, uh, together with biotechnology or biofermenter technology from, from Lund and biophysics from, from Gdansk together. The scale of, of Now, it's important that from the very beginning, we thought about the production systems that could be easily scaled up to at least um, uh, medium, uh, medium size. Um, we then spent quite a lot of time on biophysical and biochemical characterization. And one of the things, again, biotech was particularly interested in is thermostability. So we developed kits and software for um, looking at the thermostability of proteins. And this is sort of a, a, a diagram of, of, of what we did where we changed the concentration of one control component in order to shift the curve, the stability curve, over to higher temperature. So under these conditions, the protein was so we can increase the temperature of the protein up to 80 degrees. And again, that's something that in particular biotechnology is interested in. Um, being a structural biologist, of course, most of us are interested in structural determination. And uh, for the non-expert, basically, structural determination requires three steps. We have to make a crystal out of our protein. If you're lucky, it looks as pretty as this one. Uh, we send the crystal to these big particle accelerators of synchrotrons where they're being exposed um, with, uh, with X-rays. And then out of the diffraction pattern, we calculate a three-dimensional structure. And in some of our cases, it is actually the three-dimensional structure that really tells us what uh, the function of the protein is. So without going into detail, this is one of those type C targets where out of the gene sequence itself, we have absolutely no idea what this protein actually is. Now, Looking at the, stu the stu structure, we can actually deduce from the structure without any doubt that this protein, particular protein is a protease. And uh, we are pursuing this uh, a little bit further. Now, I was going to walk you through this from gene sequence to function with uh, one particular example, and uh, that's the protein called ZAB. So our starting point, the way that we look at uh, the sequences uh, on, our, on, on, on the database is simply as genes uh, sort of Following in a, in a certain in a certain uh, certain uh, order, and this protein that a we really didn't know what it what it would do. It looked in terms of sequence like nothing that there was in the database. There's some indication that it was involved into uh, endolysis or into the escape. So this is why we selected this protein for our investigation. And um, together with Saromix and Saromix Maria Hackens and Saromix of the first structure. We, we solved the structure of ZAB-A, which sort of give us a first clue how, what the protein does and, and, and how it will do this. Now, um, from a structural biology point of view, looking at the single chain here from the N terminus to the C terminus of this protein, it's a very unusual shape and it's very difficult to see what it actually does. What was already clear is that from looking at the structure, 
there's no uh, obvious cathodic cleft um, where something could bind. There's really no enzymatic activity. Um, and it shouldn't be or couldn't be sort of the normal um, protease or lytic enzyme that has been uh, seen many, many times before. What we could see is that these beta sheets, you sort of see those sheets uh, on this side and this side, they looked a bit like structurally like C2 domains. And some of these C2 domains are known for lipid bilayer binding. And that's sort of the first clue on um, what the protein can actually do. Now, the structure makes a bit more sense if we not just look at one polypeptide chain, which has this really unusual shape, but it uh, actually forms in the crystal a unique pentamer. So five different chains come together and form this double disk, uh, double disk stru structure. And now looking at this double disk structure, again, it's something that hasn't seen, hasn't seen before, but it, from a structural biology point of view, it looks a bit more like a normal protein structure. So what else can we do to see how this protein works or what it, what it actually does? Well, we can look from the top and from the bottom on the next two slides. So if we look from the top here, in the next two slides. And what we just do is we display the electrostatic potential. So everything that's positive are some positive, uh, is blue, showing some positively charged uh, side chains. Red are negatively charged side chains on here. So from the top, this protein looks really blue. So there's lots of positive charges on the top. If we look from the bottom, there are lots of negative charges up, up there. So there's clearly distinction, although the folds look somewhat similar, they look very differently if we just look at the electrostatic potential. So definitely two different functions on both sides of the protein. Now, the next clue comes actually from the symmetry. So what we can actually see, this is a pentamere times the different, uh, five, five times the same, the same structure. And that really resembles to our um, icosahedra, uh, which is our phage, um, phage capsule. So this phage actually has a shape of an icosahedra, which also has this five-fold vertices up here. So there was an immediate suggestion that this five-fold symmetry would actually match to each other. Now, we didn't have the structure of the phage uh, of this particular phage, but we have a, well, a remotely related phage structure. And we could look at the proteins, the capsid that forms these vertices up here. So there's a uh, suggestion that this symmetry fits to each other. And what we can actually do is we can hypothesize that the protein, our that a protein sits on the vertices out of this five-fold axis on the capsid. So we could imagine up here is the entire capsid. And on each of these, these uh, spikes, we have a little spike of our uh, um, ZA -Z protein. So the suggestion then is that this part here, the upper part, which has all the positive membrane to the phosphate to the negative which helps the escape of the virus. So from the structure, we can at least hypothesize um, a new mechanism for escape, which at that time we thought was um, pretty cool. Now, um, I would have loved to continue uh, this sort of from an academic uh, point of view and really try to bring these two uh, complexes together but this was pretty much at the end of our uh, project um, uh, sort of last March and uh, COVID-19 really, really hit us. And uh, so when the labs were closed down in March, we actually sat together and, and we really thought about where can we as the virus X consortium contribute to, uh, to, to the scientific efforts. And I know that a lot of structural biologists uh, started looking at uh, protein, protein structures and there's a lot of work uh, happening in the structural biology community. Um, but from the Virus X consortium, we actually thought that we might go in a slightly different direction. And the direction that we came up with was more towards testing. So as I've mentioned before, the PCR test was SARS-CoV-2, the very quickly developed and distributed in early 2020, which was really an amazing success of the scientific community. Now, our labs were closed, so we couldn't uh, contribute to that, but we did actually offer our PCR machine uh, as well as all of the BE to the NHS at that time and uh, try to help there. Um, PCR tests were really limited in the beginning uh, because they do require specialized equipment, they require time, and they actually require a lot more expertise than, uh, and, and uh, I would say attention to detail than many people realize. Um, so I think in most countries in the developing world, PCR tests are now standard, but there's still many countries uh, in the world, particularly in the developing world, 
for PCR tests might not be the best or uh, the appropriate solution. So over the last few months and faster, cheaper and easier detection methods came online. So one of these um, uh, antigen tests, lateral flow devices shown on the right hand side. Um, these are really easy to use. Uh, however, the accuracy is, is, is not as good as PCR tests. So we looked into uh, another technology that has been around for about 10, 10 years, which is called loop mediated amplification PCR. So this method should be almost as easy as a lateral flow device, not quite, but um, with the expertise or the, um, all of the equipment that a full PCR um, uh, method um, requires. The, I think the largest advantage, and this is something that came out sort of the last few months only, is that PCR tests and uh, loop mediated amplification PCR tests, in principle, are able to distinguish between different variants. Of, 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 the, of the virus. And that's something that I believe will be extremely important in, in, in the coming months or in, uh, in the coming months. So without going into too much detail, all I wanna say is that this uh, essay is uh, based on the design of particular loop forming DNA primers. So the specialists up here, this is our gene of interest or the piece that we want to amplify. But then we define these um, uh, primers in a way that they form loops and in the process, come into a self-amplification process. So that means that the amplification uh, does not need um, a thermocycler. Um, we only need a strand of space in thermostable DNA polymerase, um, and it can be done at one, at one temperature. So it can be done much, much easier. It doesn't need the specialist uh, uh, equipment. And in principle, you could imagine if you were working on, on a sort of out of the box system where um, the um, everything fits into, uh, into, into one, uh, one box and can be brought into, into the community. The detection methods can be as easy as turbidity up here. So this is an example of turbidity where the negative sample is, uh, is clear. Of that they can detect uh, our, um, uh, our, our system. So, at this point, it's really our friends from, from Bergen who came up with the idea. And, and we started the project to see how can we improve the existing RTNM technology using auxiliary proteins. So we're not using a particular protein, but we have a set of auxiliary proteins that unfortunately I can't tell you which one they are at the moment because we're still working on this and, and see if we can improve uh, RTNM. For principal experiment, the whole technology turned out to be a bit more tricky than we anticipated. The primer design certainly was a lot more difficult than we thought. And a, a number of those primers that were actually really didn't work very well. So whatever, what we can show at the moment is that um, we look at the difference between our um, 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 positives. So these are the positives and the negatives up here is when we increase the concentration of our um, auxiliary protein, what basically happens is that we um, move the negatives away in terms of timing. So what we can basically do is we have the difference between a positive and a negative up here is increased. So we increase the specificity of our, uh, of our RTLM assay. Um, and again, Active Enzymes is really one of the companies and one of the guys uh, absolutely leading this and helping us a lot with that. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is really come up with protocols how these auxiliary proteins could be used uh, to improve RTMM technology. It should also be noted that, of course, RTMM technology is not only used for SARS-CoV-2, you can use the same uh, technology just with different primers for, 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 for other pathogens. So in summary, where are we and, and how, how have we done? Um, in the last part from protein characterization, starting with 659 genes that were targeted in the beginning, um, 42% were produced, which is a de decent number. Um, quite a few were characterized. Uh, we had a 24 different or uh, 22 new crystal structures. So, but I think what's most important is that not just these auxiliary proteins, but a number of proteins are now in our in, in the product development. So, as I've said in the beginning, we really set out to start um, with um, finding molecules or proteins that have innovation value. And at the end of the four years, we have actually quite a few that are in product development with our partners. And uh, 
that uh, is, is uh, well, we were quite pleased with that. I should say this funnel in terms of coming down uh, at each of these steps, uh, we reached or exceeded what we promised to the European Union. So that was also quite, quite pleasing. Now, um, where we go from there? Well, we're gonna continue product development up here. Unfortunately, not funded by the European Union anymore, but obviously we're trying to find new funding. But most importantly, I should just um, at the end, give a special thanks to the Dirt and Virus-X teams, the people involved in this project. So this is uh, uh, here at the data collection. Uh, the experts will recognize some detection pattern up here. So we were sitting in our labs at home, uh, controlling the synchrotron from a couple of computers. Um, Steffi, who's helping us uh, with the, um, um, the questions today, she's looking at crystal trace and Katie is setting up crystal trace up here uh, from the more crystallization. And with those, I would like to thank again the organizers and I'm happy to answer any questions.